It is such an honor and a privilege to be able to walk together, especially during times like this. This is um, a great uh, three-day period coming up uh, for us individually and as families, as a church, and for the kingdom of God. And I can't think of anybody that I would rather walk through these times with than the people that God has put into our lives and have enriched us so much. So uh, today we're going to get ready for 2020. I know we're already in it, but let's get ready some more for it. And to do that, I want you to read with me in Hebrews chapter 12. Surrounded then as we are by this serried rank of witnesses. Don't you love that? Let us strip off everything that hinders us, as well as the sin which dogs our feet. And let us run the race that we have to run with patience. Our eyes fixed on Jesus, the source and the goal of our faith. For he himself endured a cross, and thought nothing of its shame because of the joy he knew would follow his suffering. And he is now seated at the right hand of God's throne. Think constantly of him enduring all that sinful men could say against him. And you will not lose your purpose, or your courage. Here's another brief translation. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. It's a good word. We're getting ready to move into a time of preparation and I think uh, that we should do what the Scripture says. We should study how he did it. Now, I want to begin by just reminding you of one thing. Just in case you need reminding of this, it is this. God intends for you and I to do well. He is a good father. He wants his children to do well and to be well. He wants a sense of well-being in us. It has nothing to do with our circumstances. It has nothing to do with what's going on around us. But a general sense of well-being. Our Father does not plot against us. He does not work to make it more difficult. By the way, it's already difficult. Life was designed to be difficult. If you fight that your entire life, life will be more difficult for you. If you resign yourself to the fact that life is difficult, an amazing thing happens, and that is life becomes less difficult. God is not intending to make anything more difficult. Now, sometimes people do because people want to act like something's more spiritual if it's more difficult. That's not necessarily true. God and the Spirit of God and the Son of God are out to make sure that we do well, that we prosper, and that we succeed. And so if we're going to do that over the next three days and for the rest of this year, we ought to study to see how he did it because he did very well. And he finished his course. And so let me just give you a couple of things by way of introduction that you need if you're going to do well in 2020. And especially if you're going to do well over the next three days. We begin our fast tonight with our evening meal and we will finish on Wednesday night. And let me just say that uh, during Pilgrim's, the Pilgrim's Progress, if you would like to bring a few things to snack on, uh, we will be finishing uh, uh, during that time, and so you may, you are free to do that. Uh, now, please be wise in what you bring, and uh, and uh, 
but I know you will be. Uh, but after three days, we'll want to have a little something to chew on. And so uh, we'll probably have a few things here. But um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that to you. Uh, so if, let me give you these three things that are really necessary for us. If you're going to do well in anything, these are three ingredients that must be part of it. The first one is you've got to have a vision for it. If you don't have a vision for something, you're not going to engage in it. You're not going to embrace it. You're not going to invest in it. You're not going to endure through it. The, the, Jesus had a vision that was way beyond what he was going through. He had a joy that was set before him, and he kept his eyes. Because, you see, vision is the seeing aspect. Vision is where I am seeing more than the obvious or just the apparent. I see a bigger picture. I see a wider perspective. I see more than just what is in front of me. And so if I'm going to be involved in anything and do well in it, I first of all have to have a vision for it. There are people who attend local churches who have absolutely no vision for that local church whatsoever. And so they feel like, well, I'm there, I'm not there, it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, whether I invest or I don't, whether I'm a part or I'm not. And when, when I have no vision for something, I'm probably not too inclined uh, to invest myself or involve myself in it. And so it, it's the same with fasting. If I don't have a vision for it, I'm probably not going to do it. That's why most believers probably don't fast very often, because we just don't have a vision for it. So number one, you have to have a vision for it. Number two, you have to have a, a motivation for it. Uh, motivation is the knowing aspect. Motivation is, is what I know beyond uh, what is coming at me. You see, when Jesus came, he knew that he was going to fall into the hands of men. But he also knew that no matter how much not fun that was going to be, which incidentally, over the next three days, I wouldn't classify this as fun. Uh, I mean, people say, well, you know, I don't want to do that. It's not fun. Well, Jesus knew when he fell into the hands of men, this was not going to be a fun time. But he also knew something more than that. Beyond the beating, beyond the wounding, beyond the crucifixion, he knew that this was going to be the end of sin rule, Satan rule, and self rule. He knew that that was going to be brought down by walking through this particular time. And so I have to have a motivation. Motivation is what keeps me going through something because I know more. Okay, I've got a little bit of hunger. I got this. I got that going on. But I also know more than that. I know that there's something bigger going on here than just that. So I have to have motivation for it. <clears throat> and the third thing is there has to be some preparation for it. Preparation is the, you see, vision is the seeing aspect. Motivation is the knowing aspect, but preparation is the doing aspect. Jesus actually spent a great deal of time in preparation. And so everything in God, if you will notice when you move through the Word of God, everything, every process in God has some sort of preparation that is attached to it. There is this preparation that goes with the processes of God. And so preparation is crucial. It is absolutely important. If we're going to move through 2020 and, and do well in 2020, there has to be some preparation for that. And if we're going to move through the next three days and, and, and see what God wants to accomplish, there's going to have to be some preparation for that too. I don't want to just step into something without being prepared because my preparation is also going to make sure that I get all the way through it. So let me just give you a couple of reasons why preparation is so important just in general in the kingdom of God. And one of those reasons why is that preparation gets me to what is next. Now, I want you to think about this. Passover has a preparation. And if you don't prepare, you don't pass over. You understand? You don't get to participate in Passover. You don't get to celebrate Passover if you don't do the cel if you don't do the preparation. So Sabbath has preparation. So I don't really get to honor the Sabbath and without the preparation. Now, I'm pulling this out of the Word. I'm pulling this out of Jewish history and out of the experience of the Word. Well, Jesus understood the same thing. When he came, he had a 30-year season of preparation. And that preparation was getting ready for his mission. 
But then on top of that, he had a 40-day period when he began his mission where he prepared for the ministry of that mission and the manifestation of that mission. Now, you see, he had the 30 years, that was preparation in God, and then he had the 40 days. Now, what does the Bible say? When he was going out into the wilderness, the Bible describes it this way. He was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness, right? Didn't say that he just uh, sort of skipped his way out there. He was literally driven into the wilderness. Now, he wasn't driven into a 40-day period of fasting because he didn't want to go. He was driven because he needed to go. It was part of the preparation. Now, preparation gets me to what is on the other side. It opens the door. And so it's possible that I can actually miss out on something if I am what? Unprepared. Let me show you what I mean. Moses. He has a promise that he's to be a deliverer. He has the calling. He has the anointing. He has the skill to be a deliverer. And on top of that, he's even in the right place. He's there in Egypt. And to demonstrate his delivering ability, he even takes out one of the enemy. Yet God understands that with all of that in place, he is still not prepared to be a deliverer. So he is then sent into a season of 40 years into the desert, on the backside of the desert, no less, into a place called Midian. He had no idea what Midian was. He'd never been there, didn't ask to go there, didn't want to be there. And there was nothing in Midian that even demonstrated even slightly that any of this was helping him to become a deliverer. He is building a home. He's raising a family. He's tending someone else's sheep. It's not even his own. He's on the backside of the desert. His self-avowed claim is that I am a stranger in a strange land. And for 40 years, he is there. And he has forgotten everything about being a deliverer. And once all of that has been forgotten and God has seasoned him in the desert, the Lord comes and speaks to him and says, now you're ready. And he says, no, I'm not. Well, then God knew, yes, you are. Because he thought he was. It took 40 years of God convincing him where he said, no, I'm not. God said, now you are. And when God sent him back, he became his deliverer, having seen and the fire and the voice coming out of the fire. He went back and he delivered God's people. But he would have never done that 40 years earlier because it is the time of preparation. You see, the children of Israel spent a long time in Egypt. And much of that time in Egypt was preparing them for what God had for them because he had declared in his word, I will have a prepared people for a prepared land. And he could not have an unprepared people for a prepared land. So he had a prepared people. And then he brings them out and passes them through a short wilderness time hoping that that would be enough to get them in. It was not. It took another 40 years of more preparation to get them in. But when they entered, they were prepared to take the land. Preparation is what helps me to lay hold of what is next. It is the key. Now, in our day, we would assign Moses up right away. He's got the promise. He's got the calling. He's got the anointing. He's got the skill. He's right here. It's everything we've asked for. He's the guy. But not in God's book. Because God sees preparation more important oftentimes than the mission itself. Because secondly, preparation is what gives you the stamina to finish. You know, you think about this. Scott mentioned the Super Bowl. Are the Packers in the Super Bowl? We don't know yet. If they are, I'm not coming. <laughs> you know, we see, we see all of the people cheering 
and, and we see all of the cheerleaders and, and we see everybody jumping up and down in the end zone and those big uh, huddles where they dance around and do all that at the beginning of the game. We see all of that. But what we don't see is all the stuff that they've been doing all week long to get ready. That was the preparation time. Athletes understand if we are going to finish if we're going to gain, if we're going to win, there has to be preparation because the preparation is going to serve us well. Not necessarily at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the game, it's going to serve us well when we're in the trenches, when we're in the fourth quarter and we've got a couple of minutes left and we need to reach back and lay hold of a little extra stamina and a little extra strength and power. That is what preparation does. It pushes us over the line. And so preparation makes sure that by the time I'm in October or November, that I am doing well and rising in the things of God, just like I was at the beginning. Because human nature is, you know human nature, right? January, sign up for the, uh, the, uh, uh, the gym, right? <laughs> Start the diet. By the way, my wife has not let me have any fudge in two weeks. But it's paying off. It's paying off. And one day soon, I'm coming into church on a Sunday, and I will be wearing trousers that I used to wear. It's paying off. All of this stuff happens in January. Resolutions, everything. Because it's human nature. We start big. We go full out. Go big or go home. Well, there's not near as much going big in October. Because we've lost the stamina. Now, that's just human nature. That's not sin. It's just human nature. We start big and then we just... But you see, in the kingdom, I can't afford to do that. Because in the kingdom of God, I have to finish. Do you know the people in Matthew 25 that actually go in to see the bridegroom are not the people who are present. It's the people who are prepared. And those who were prepared went in. When you see the, 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 the table with the bride sitting around the table in Revelation 19, and, and John's looking at this, and he says to the angel, he says, who's all the... He said, this is the bride, and the bride has made herself ready. Notice, he doesn't say, well, those are just church people or ordinary folk or religious people. Those are people who have made themselves ready. They have submitted to the ways of preparation in their God that has allowed access into more, and they finished it. Paul says we're in a race, we're in a contest, we're in a battle. We need to finish. I need to finish the year strong, and I need to finish my three days of fasting strong. Right? I'm really, I, I, I'm almost hesitant to tell you, but I, I am pumped for this one. I, I, just, I, I just sense that there is a readiness in my spirit to do this. And I can't always say that. It hasn't always been that way. But I, I appreciate that and the Lord to help me get ready. Probably because my wife's had me on chicken and broccoli for two weeks. And that, that's, that'll get you ready. All right. So here's what I want to do. How do you and I prepare for this next three days? Because God wants you to do well. He wants you to do well. And we want each other to do well. We want to finish this. And some people's perspective is, well, it's only three days. And other people's perspective is, man, that's three days. <laughs> Let me give you some professions. If you will take these professions into this, you will do really well. Okay? Okay. I'm going to give you some professions. I think I have it. Oh, no, I didn't give you that. First one, here's the first pr profession. I am right in his sight. Now, hang on. Look at this. God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. I am right in his sight. You know what that means? I don't have to crawl my way into this. I don't have to back my way in. I don't have to hang my head. 
when I move into this, I'm moving into this as a favored right child of God. I have all of the privilege of a son of God. I have his honor on my life. I don't have to hang my head. I don't have to uh, be sheepish. I don't have to sort of... I can enter this boldly and confidently because I am a child of God who is absolutely right in his sight. That is an amazing thing. Can you declare that? I mean, I am right in his sight. Let me give you a... uh, I want to read to you a little... um, quotation. Here it is. I cannot make myself right with God. I cannot make my life perfect. I can only be right with God if I accept the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ as an absolute gift. Am I humble enough to accept it? I have to surrender all my rights and demands and cease from every self-effort. Not done yet, but need to stop there. Cease from every self-effort. Well, Pastor Buddy, I'm going to try real hard over this three days. No. I cease from every self-effort. I must leave myself completely alone in his hands. And then I can begin to pour out my life in prayer. There is a great deal of prayer that comes from actual disbelief in the atonement. Jesus is not just beginning to save us. He has already saved us completely. It is an accomplished fact. And it is an insult to him for us to ask him to do what he has already done. As I step into this season in God beginning tonight, I'm in his favor. I'm in his heart, just like you. We are in a place of great privilege. I'm not proving anything to him. I don't have to prove anything to him. I don't have to act a certain way. I don't have to be a certain way. I don't have to act like I've got it all together. I just come before him. And I lay my life before him. And if God should so choose, if he would choose to amend and change and arrange and rearrange and convict and work in my life, fine. My heart is wide open to him. But I'm certainly not coming to him having to prove anything to him. I am right in his sight. And I just feel in the spirit right now that someone you're just carrying some shame and in just in this moment, and Jesus is saying, throw it off. Throw it off. It doesn't belong to you. It certainly doesn't belong to me. Lay it down. Because the eyes of him which whom we have to do, he sees all. And he has already atoned. And I'm right in his sight. So as I enter this fast, there is no merit, there is no worth on my part. 
It is his mercy and his atoning for me that allows me to do it. Here's the second one. Oh, where is my second one? Let's see if I can find it. There it is. <laughs> I have grace upon grace. Here it is. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. What does that mean, Pastor Buddy? That means that you can do more than you think you can. That's exactly what that means. That means that I have more, I have received more, there's much more, there's more than I know, more than I realize, more than enough. In other words, this time of prayer and fasting can be greater and better than any other time I've ever had because there's more. Come on, I can do more. I can do more than I think I can. Well, I know my body and I know that. Listen, I have grace upon grace. Well, you don't understand. I got a little bit, you know, that. Oh, I have grace upon grace. There is more grace working in me, more than enough to move through every challenge that God, in every season of preparation that God gives me. There is more than enough. You know, what is amazing about the more than enough. I can do this because when I come to the end of what I have and my own power, might, strength, and ability, there is way more in Him. You see, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living in me. Now look, I have a body, you have a body. I have a mind, you have a mind. I have a soul, you have a soul. But the difference is... I am a spirit. I have a body, but I am a spirit. And my spirit is full of the Holy Spirit. And that same spirit that enabled Jesus to fast and pray is in me. And the same spirit that enabled Moses and empowered Moses on the mountain for 40 days is in me. And the same spirit that empowers His church is in me. So I have grace upon grace. So I will not start this by saying, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can finish this. I'm not sure how far I can get. Because I have grace upon grace. Now, this will challenge your flesh. Now, let's just say this. As you and I are moving through this, please understand your mind will have its own opinions. Your body will have its own opinions. Your soul will have its own opinions. But none of those opinions matter in light of the power of the Holy Spirit. I have grace upon grace. I can do it. And here we go. Number three. I will contend to the end. You know what that means? I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish. Here's a scripture. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Resist the temptation to pronounce mature judgment on anything before the appointed time when all will be fully revealed. You know what he's saying? Don't come to a conclusion before you get to the conclusion. You know what that means? That means I'm not going to cast a judgment and say, well, I don't think this is really doing any good anyway. Do you know that there are so many people in the Bible who are participating with God in the kingdom and they have no idea what is going on and yet these amazing things are happening. Remember those four guys that were all lepers? They're marching in, they're walking into the camp of the enemy. Well, they're sort of, they're sort of straggling their way in the camp, but they have no idea that their feet are making noise in the spirit and it is being translated into the sound of horses and chariot and it literally drives the enemy off. Now they had no no way of knowing that, but it was happening. Daniel, when he was praying as an old man, he began praying over a season and nothing was happening. 21 days he's praying, fasting, whatever he's doing, nothing happening. No indication whatsoever. All of a sudden, Gabriel shows up. Now, if you're praying and Gabriel shows up, that would be impressive. Gabriel comes and he says to him, oh, he says, Daniel, you're much loved. You're beloved. And I just want to let you know, from the first day that you began praying, 
we began to come. And, I, and I've been making my journey toward you. Uh, but he said, there, there's a lot of resistance up in the heavenlies that you didn't see, you didn't know about. There was war going on up there. You couldn't see it, but it's happening all up there. The princes of Persia and all of this, all these demonic principalities up there. And he said, I had to deal with all of these guys, but I'm here. And what he's literally telling Daniel is, your prayer was more powerful than all those principalities because I broke through and I made it. You know, those women sitting by the river, wanting so desperately for God to come and to visit them and for the word of the Lord to be made manifest in Philippi. They're by the river and they're praying and they're praying and every week they pray. Every week they pray and they keep praying. And they have no idea that their prayer is being transformed into a vision of a rather large Macedonian man who has all the appearance and the accent of a Macedonian. They have no idea that their prayer is turning into a vision that is bringing the answer to them. You see, please do not judge what you may think or may not think is happening when you are fasting and praying. Let's let God reveal that when he chooses to reveal it. Because there is so much that is going on that we simply can't see. Abraham goes up on the mountain. He is praying for Lot down in Sodom. God ha and, 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 and he is told uh, God he's going to pray over Sodom. And Abraham has no idea. He can't see what his prayer is doing. But his prayer is literally jerking Lot's family out of Sodom and saving their life. But Abraham can't see that. He's up on top of the mountain. He doesn't have that kind of vision to be able to see that. But it is God who is working when he was praying. We contend to the end. We finish. So... Let me give you, here's the rest of that verse. Instead, wait until the Lord makes his appearance, for he will bring all that is hidden in darkness to light. God will show it. Some of it may not even be revealed in this life. Who cares? It's God's business. I think most of, of what we have done in this life and putting our hands to the kingdom, most of what we have done we will see on the other side and not this side. So, let me just give you some tips as we're finishing up. As you begin this evening, we will start with our evening meal. We will skip our evening meal and we will move through until Wednesday evening. And we will break our fast here. Uh, begin with vision and genuine faith. It's a no-brainer. If I start low, I probably will finish lower. I'm going to start high. Vision, faith, motivation. Set your spirit to seek after God. Spend as much time as possible in the Word and in prayer. And write down the impressions. My wife and I, uh, when we uh, go through a time of fasting and prayer, there are certain things that we don't turn on, certain things that we don't do. Uh, we make more time in our schedule. And um, we, don't, uh, we don't bombard ourselves with entertainment, uh, not because the entertainment is bad. It's just out of place. This is a time for fasting and prayer. It's not a time uh, for watching entertainment. So we turn that off. And we turn it off so that we can receive better and hear more of what God is saying. And we write those impressions down. Drink lots of filtered water. You can also uh, tap into some uh, clear broth if you'd like or some clear juice if you need a little, uh, just a little bit of a, uh, of a kick uh, to help you. Uh, expect to visit the facilities often, <laughs> right? Yep. Uh, expect some mental and physical challenges. Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, dizziness, uh, maybe a little bit of headache. You're not dying. No, your body will tell you, oh, I'm dying. Mild nausea, maybe foul taste in your mouth, a little bit of the blahs. And um, also avoid uh, rigorous physical activity if you possibly can at all. But walking is very beneficial. And, in fact, walking uh, uh, will help to uh, clear your head. And um, it's a great way for the Lord to, to speak to you as well. Uh, avoid uh, caffeinated drinks uh, like coffee and tea and cola. And please... Don't do artificial sweeteners. And if you chew gum, it'll just make you hungry. 
and you don't want to do that. Um, um, so those are the, those are the tips. And uh, let me just close with this, and we're going to share communion together as we step into this season. A couple of scriptures, Deuteronomy 4, 7. No other nation is as great as we are. That's good. That's the kingdom of God. Their gods do not come near to them, but the Lord our God comes near when we pray to him. Wow. And the other one, Jeremiah thirty three three, Call to me and I will answer you. I'll tell you marvelous and wonderful things that you could never figure out on your own. God, what's the answer to this? What's the solution here? What's the remedy? What's the problem here? What's the root here? God says, I will show you marvelous and wonderful things that you cannot figure out on your own. God, we have a, a family issue. Uh, what, what is the remedy to that? Uh, this, this issue, that issue. Uh, Lord, what is the next step? I will show you marvelous and wonderful things that you could never figure out on your own. You ready? It's going to be a great time.